and let's see how you look. Okay. Let's pull the camera back a little. Sassy. And has trimmed about 80. Yeah. Nicole Smith. I love all of you guys. How many think she should gain a few pounds? Okay, how many... How many thinks it, it's just right right now? Yeah, because I... Hello lovelies, welcome back. You're here on a Tuesday and Tuesdays is where we do deep dives into the environmental, social, ethical issues of the world and we also do deep dives into a person, a tragic icon. We're talking about Anna Nicole Smith today. You don't know anything about her? Well, I'll give you a very brief introduction in just in case. So she's actually the Playboy Bunny who married a millionaire who was like about 60 years her senior. She got labelled as a gold digger and a druggie and people used her as a punching bag for literally like 20 years of her life as well across all forms of media. Oh, and also she's regarded as like one of the most beautiful women around in the world, uh, but she's only mostly known for her body. So does that sound about right when we, we're talking about women in general, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, everyone in agreement? Yep, yeah, cool. So that's what we're talking about today. The real person though. So you, my love Liz, actually chose the look that I would recreate. This was the hardest thing to be able to like narrow down as well. If you aren't following me on IG as well, because in my stories that is how I get information about what topics you want me to cover. So that's how we've got like all of our spooky stories for Halloween sorted for the whole month of October. So if you're not following me, do check me out right there. Until I hit that 1k mark and I can finally make my Marilyn Monroe video. That's just how we communicate. That's just the best way to do it. Obviously, I really, really do appreciate you commenting and subscribing because that's how I can grow on this channel. It makes a massive difference to me. So thank you so, so, so much if you do that. And also a special thanks to Kimmy as well, one of my subscribers. You've been here for many years. And also you're the one that actually put me onto many of these resources that I've used for this video. So thank you so, so much. Because I know that you're an Anna Nicole Smith fan. So thank you. All of my sources, as always, are in the description box down below, as well as all the products I've used on my face. Everything is cruelty-free, vegan, not owned by parent companies that test on animals, as always. We know that she didn't like to wear fur, she still ate chicken, but hey, she's still kind of an animal advocate in some sort of way. Now my loves, we do have some trigger warnings that I do want to talk you through today because uh, your mental health matters. There's going to be mentions of death, overdose, fat phobia and uh, body shaming in general, pill taking and addiction. Now whilst it wasn't actually proven that she had a pill addiction or anything, I know that the topics I'm going to be bringing up, especially for a big portion of this video, is actually going to be triggering if you have had a pill addiction in the past. So I just want to raise that with you because I want you to leave this video able to have a good day at the end of it. I do not want to ruin anybody's day. That's never really my intention. Yes, let's get right on into it. If you think we're not having some wine with this, then sorry. Her childhood. Oh, Vicky Lynn, which is her real name. I'm pretty sure that you'll know that. So her childhood was not exactly what we would refer to as being a good one. She grew up in what I consider to be a pretty big household in the outskirts of Houston, Texas. Her father left when she was like two months old. He was like a really, really bad person, according to her mother. Her and her mother did not have a very good relationship. She actually really didn't like her mother. Wow, isn't this becoming a theme with a lot of these people? Bad parents. Wouldn't you imagine that the stuff that happens to you in childhood can actually affect you all the way to adulthood? Therapy should be free. So her mother was like super, super strict. She remarried and allegedly allowed terrible things to happen to Anna. Unspeakable sort of stuff. Like she doesn't talk about that time very much. There's kind of like this vibe of the fact that her parents wanted stuff from her. Like for example there was a Christmas that she threw for them and she was really excited because she could finally actually afford to do that and they left after like 30 minutes after taking like the very expensive gifts that she bought for them. So whenever her mother talks in interviews basically I don't really trust what she says because of what Anna has said about her and I'm I'm more inclined to believe the victim. And a lot of you will know that she actually moved to Mexico in Texas, like just a little further out, like tiny, tiny little town. She dropped out of school when she was a freshman, so she didn't actually complete her high school. So this is obviously important because we know that the prejudice that comes with not completing your schooling, blah, 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 blah. Like the real story behind why she dropped out was because like, there was a fight that happened from her friend who beat her up. No one stood up for her, no one did anything, including the teacher that saw it, eventually broke it up after five, like, knockout punches. She was just humiliated. So she went to work and 
him and the brothers they were like come out here we want to finish a job and like luckily another fry cook was there that like stood up for her but it's like this awful traumatic experience not only that but she really really struggled at school just don't get me started on the way that schools actually like fail children in a lot of cases and then she was just working at Jim's crispy fried chicken she married the fry cook and she had her son Daniel then as well because like she was lonely she was literally trapped in this house and she couldn't get away she couldn't do anything like he wouldn't even let her to go to like the store and so she figured like the way to not be lonely anymore is to have a child please don't do that it's not a good reason to have a child she was still working at this time and like her husband would call up and then she figured out that he was actually abusing her son after six months she was like okay i actually need to go and so they left i haven't found a single interview of her actually talking about that experience and if she didn't want to talk about the trauma that's absolutely fine but then after she left, she then got into stripping and she went to a gentleman's club in Houston, Texas. Like she moved back to Texas so then she could earn more money, be away from this abusive husband in this small town that would very easily find you. But of course, like when she went to this gentleman's club, like she didn't actually realize like how seedy it was. And so she went in there and she like basically ran out. She was freaking out. She was not prepared for this, right? But then again, she went back because it's like she got $50 and she's like, this is so much money. Like oh my god life changing and so then she went back and she continued working there for three years and during this time is when she got her boob jobs done but then this is not really talked about but those boob jobs would actually come to haunt her for much of her life actually this is just what happened to her because they were so darn big you know by getting them bigger you get more money right oh the exploitation but around this time, like close to the three year mark, like J. Howard Marshall rolled on in the oil tycoon. So we kind of know where the story goes from here. So he paid for a lap dance from her. And this was after his wife had passed. So heartbroken, he went to a strip club, like, I don't know exactly how soon after she had passed away, but yeah, whatever, whatever you do to deal with your grief. And basically from there, he just plucked her out of it and was just like, no, you don't have to live this life anymore. I'm going to take care of you. So who wouldn't take up that opportunity instead of being literally manhandled in the worst ways for the past three years? <laughs> Poor Anna. So let's talk a little bit about love. So J. Howard Marshall was in his 80s when they met and she was like very early 20s. So there was like over a 60 year age gap between them. Now, the thing is that he actually proposed to her many times during their time together, but she was always like, mm, I want to make something of myself first because I do not want to be labelled as a gold digger. Guess what still happened? Their love was sincere, but it's not like being in love in the way that we think of like why people would get married today. Now, I need to remind you once again, like marriage was a thing as like property ownership, literally historically. It's like you go from your father and you get sold to the next person that's gonna own you. It was about connections. It was about security of assets. That was what it was about, it was a transaction. But they had like this deep affection for each other, a bit more like the way that you'd think of like a grandfather or like a role model figure has towards a child, which when I say it, it sounds super, super creepy, but that was just kind of how it was. But it wasn't the fact that they didn't like have a deep connection together. Because honestly, like, <laughs> I've watched way too much of the Anna Nicole show to know how much like she deeply cared for him and same as in the court cases same as in everything like she really did have like this deep affection for him almost like he was a savior of her like it was like legit it's not the fact that she was just like oh, i'm gonna manipulate this old man and get all of his money no it was actually like this connection that they had because he was dealing with heartbreak she was dealing with a whole bunch of like dark stuff too and it's like you can create that connection and if you go saying about gold digger bs i'm actually just going to delete the comments so <laughs> bye hater <laughs> leave the comment leave the engagement but then i'm going to delete it bye can people just acknowledge the fact that we don't know what everyone is dealing with in their lives which drives them to do certain things that they do so he actually gave her the resources that she could never actually afford for her son he cared for her heaps they had a lot of fun together they lived a good life together and then after they'd been together for two whole years she then got married to him so it was only after two years and of course like all of the playboy stuff happened during this time as it as well so that was when of course like the famous like photos came out about their wedding and then everyone was like oh my god look at this gold digger oh what a piece of trash because you know hating on women is just like such a fun pastime so they get married nuptials lovely 
and boom, she gets branded with being a gold digger, which is a label that doesn't really shift ever. People didn't actually care that they were both happy, they didn't care that neither one of these parties were being taken advantage of, and also the fact that she had actually said no so 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 many times for their whole relationship. Like he asked to marry her in a week of being together and she's like, mm -mm. If she wanted the money she could have just married him instantly. His son was executor of the estate and kind of like looked after the will and all the paperwork and all of that fun stuff which kind of determines who gets what when someone passes away, you know, all that fun stuff. Yeah, he was in charge of that. It wouldn't be up to him to be able to manipulate stuff now, would it? <laughs> in the conversations that Anna and J. Howard Marshall actually had, he was going to leave her half of everything, all of that good stuff. However, none of that was actually put in writing. And then of course ensues the decade-long court battle, which I won't go into too much detail on here because I would really love a lawyer to react to this. The person that was representing J. Howard Marshall's estate is like the typical kind of lawyer that you think of in your head when you think of an evil lawyer, Rusty. Even all the way up to Supreme Court, and this is where the very famous line, screw you Rusty, comes out. And honestly, I'm with Anna on this. The public, everyone was actually on Anna's side until Rusty came after her in like awful, awful ways. Now Anna was not a smart person. She dropped out of school at 15 and she'd never gotten like further education, anything. Like she'd learned how to survive effectively, like if you think of it on the streets. And so you get a particular kind of smarts then, but you don't get smarts where you're able to actually stand up for yourself in court and understand all of the manipulation tactics, the huge words that are being used against you, everything. So basically the way that this court like proceeding all went down was really awful for someone that isn't educated enough in this. But this is also where she met Howard K. Stern. <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts on him, which we'll be talking about in a whole separate section, wow! So anyway, getting back to love. So a while after his passing, she met photographer Larry Burkhead. And when she did, she was like, okay, I actually want to hire you to do the photography for me when I do like this like children's camp thing. So that's exactly what happened. And this is where Larry actually saw her in a way that wasn't actually just playing up for the cameras or for men. So he saw her in this like more natural state and just saw like the amount of care, compassion, joy, happiness that she actually had when she was around children. And this is when he was like, Dang, this woman's amazing. So they get into a relationship soon afterwards, which goes on for many, many years. It was quite a tumultuous relationship. Like, he described it as being like a War of the Roses thing. That was what they would joke about a lot. That's a movie on Disney, which I think I'm going to watch tonight because uh, I actually want to have a weekend rather than spending all of my time researching for this video. Like, for real, for real split up this time. She told him that she was pregnant and then obviously everything changed. And then she started to get weaned off her many medications as well, which we'll be talking about again later. This is where things start to get like really wild because and then close to the time that Danny Lynn was about to be born, like she actually escaped to the Bahamas and she didn't take Larry with her, but she took Howard. Yeah, Howard K. Stern, that dude, that one, yeah. Mm. Her manager, lawyer, agent, lover? Mm, so many things that this person just happened to wind themselves up in with Anna Nicole. And it was actually really at the Bahamas that everything bad absolutely started to happen. And at the Bahamas too, a month after the thing that we would have wished upon our worst enemies happened, um, there was actually a commitment ceremony between her and Howard. Like... Honestly, I don't think there was any love there, only possession, but we'll be talking about that, okay? So that is the love life summed up, really. Like, she also had some dates here and there with some people who honestly give me, like, ugh, ick. A sex object. With the key word here being object. So you start your life to fame as a stripper, right? That is gonna be one heck of a sticky label to try and get rid of. It's a bit more like being branded for life, sadly, because the way that we treat women is just either or category with the Madonna Hall complex, which I'll link up here as well. And then if you actually become like a Playboy cover girl, oh my god, it's almost like you're just wearing like the red scarlet letter on you all the time. That's literally kind of like what happened to Anna because it was like, everyone's just gonna be thinking about them titties, you know? No one's gonna be thinking about anything else. I could say so, so, so much about Hugh Hefner and 
the exploitation compound that he ran and the way that he completely exploited and abused women many women actually um, in order to actually gain himself like further fame and glory and money um, but that's a separate video strictly objectification it's not appreciation there's no connection there it's just object and this was how Anna Nicole Smith was 100% branded object and trying to shake this off was like trying to I don't know you know when you use glitter and it just never leaves ever, even if it's years ago? That's kind of what dealing with this was like, but it's almost like you just exploded a confetti can of glitter in your house and you're still trying to clean it up like 20 years later because that was the case for Anna Nicole Smith. So she absolutely struggled to fight this label that she was like being brandished as and like she really wanted to be a serious actress. Like she had this dream of being able to recreate all of Marilyn Monroe's movies. So when she actually did the Playboy stuff, she really genuinely struggled to be able to actually do this as well. Like she was hiding in the dressing room just like, oh my god, oh my god, like just freaking out. She talks again in this interview, the one interview where she gets treated as a human, which is funnily enough done by a Swedish woman, even though they still talk about her bobs. The thing is that she knew to be able to get anywhere, she had to do this opportunity, like because that's how it gets sold, an opportunity. <laughs> Not an opportunity for other people to see you and objectify you and brandish you as being a terrible person for the rest of your life. No. And then also ask your son, how do you feel about the fact that your mother's posed naked? Wow, it's almost like as soon as you become a mother you're not allowed to be a sexual person anymore. Because obviously like she knew as everyone else knew that as a female, your value relies on your youth, your beauty, your body, and that really is it. And of course we all know that as soon as you hit the age of 30 you turn into a soggy brown paper bag and that is just it. But also it's like whilst this could be a thing of opportunity, it also brandishes you as to which path you can go down. It's a very handmaid's tale, you know, it's like do you get to wear blue or red? So you get to wear red now because you've done this work and as soon as you've done anything to do with like some sort of sex work, mm, you're not a human anymore. And so that was kind of how she was treated again and again and again her whole life. So even when she was doing acting, so she did like these bit parts where she was just like, she had a line and then she also got to go row and that was it. And I'm like, okay. She got a starring role eventually and then she gets put in like the skyscraper and like there's a version of it on YouTube and I was like okay let's see like I want to see if she can act and I was like this is softcore. Oh my god I was I wasn't expecting that but again that was because she kept on getting put in these roles where it was literally just about that part of her. I wanted to see how she could act, not if she could fake no. Because traditionally men wanted you, well, traditionally and sadly still in many respects, men wanted you to be like this one particular thing. And she knew what that was and she managed to play into it very well. The whole Marilyn Monroe comparison because people would compare her to that even though in my opinion she's more like Jane Mansfield in terms of like her structure, her body structure, everything. She reminds me a lot more of Jane Mansfield. And she had like this very strong obsession with Marilyn. She thought that she was Marilyn incarnate at one point. She wanted to remake all of Marilyn's movies. She actually lived in the house that Marilyn Monroe died in as well, like for a period of time. She was obsessed with Marilyn and she also carried around her VHS tapes. But she never actually thought of herself as being like literally Marilyn because she recognized herself that no one could be as good as Marilyn, like no one can replace her. But she almost saw her as being like this guardian angel of her, you know? So what people literally see when they look at Anna Nicole is this object that is made specifically for playing chess with. So she absolutely used this to her advantage and played into it as well. Like you can see it, like she loved the camera, she loved the fans, like she would do anything basically that they asked her to do because she's like, this is positive attention that I'm getting and I need attention. Like, like every woman is always taught, like you're taught that you're meant to be appreciative of the value that you're given based on your looks. You're taught that you're meant to want the attention and everyone's always taught that, oh, you want to be famous, right? Like, you're so pretty, you want to be famous, of course. And so the more of that that you get becomes like this high that you get as well. The infamous incident with the 2004 AMAs. Let's talk. So she goes on stage, 
she appears to be out of her mind drunk or on something like slurring her words <laughs> it's an infamous take which many 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 people have actually you know parodied made into like skits and stuff including people like Tina Fey and Amy Poehler um I love Amy Poehler so this is very disappointing for me but this was actually just how it was at the time and of course like Anna Nicole Smith had become like the punching bag for everyone let's just talk about this because that never left her life like even though she passed away in 2007 for three years that was an incident that just haunted her so do you want to know the real story of why that actually happened well the night before, she actually had a seizure, like a full, like, grand mal seizure. Larry had no idea what to do, but then when she came to afterwards, like, she was still like, mm -mm, I'm not going to hospital, I don't want all of the press to know where I am, that would just not work well for me, so what I'm going to do is I'm still going to hold my promise to Kanye West, because he had actually recently had her in his new video, like, he was an up-and-coming artist at the time, because this was, like, 2004. And so she makes herself go to this thing. I don't know if you've had any experience with people that have had a seizure, I have, and depending on the person, it can take days to recover from, like, some people have to get hospitalised for it, but in my experience, like, speech is slurred for ages, like, they're just very much out of it. And this was exactly what was just happening to Anna. So she couldn't really function at all, and so this is why you see, like, what appears to be a high mess on your hands when she actually just wanted to uphold a promise that she would made to Kanye West. If people actually knew the truth, I'm kind of hoping that they would have treated her better because it was disgusting to say the least, the treatment that she got for most of her famous life after that court experience. It was the courts that just ruined her image forever. Screw you, Rusty. I hate Rusty. I hope he never gets a cold side of the pillow. We need to talk about her body. Mostly, her weight. This covered most of her life, sadly. Because that's all that a woman's worth. Your looks. The media and press, disgusting to her. Everyone in general, disgusting to her. Mostly about her body and her weight. She was almost like this poster child for cringe culture because everyone regardless of where you stood would attack her and make her into the butt of the joke like constantly all the time always there's just elitism sexism fat phobia along with of course the classic staple of like shaming sex workers because they're not people right now i watched shan spears video this morning and i left her a comment about it because it just fits so perfectly in so i'm gonna link her content down below for you so you'll understand if you watch that after you've watched this like what i mean by the fact that she was like kind of like the cringe culture sort of person that everyone could punch down to so you see in the early days she was objectified in every single way possible so especially in her like guest days any interview that i've seen of her she's made to stand up to show off her body yaddy yaddy and to just allow people to leer at her and be like oh i'm loving this because like she did have this thing where she loved the attention from the camera i'm not going to deny that we're not also taught that we're meant to do that in particular as women there's a difference between like respecting someone and admiring their beauty and as a whole person like i've got no shame in doing that for people but i also like to point out that there's a difference between that and objectification so when she actually gained weight, which she actually talked about in her interviews as well, because not only were they asking her about her weight gain and saying that she used to be the most beautiful woman in the world, that she used to be beautiful, that she used to be gorgeous. What happened? What happened to your body? She said in the interviews, I was really depressed. I'm just struggling. The way that they talk about her to her face saying that she doesn't care anymore, saying that she's disgusting and she does the thing that we do right like she asks them it's like I don't understand can you explain like the same way that we do when we get asked or when, she, when we get told like racist or sexist jokes or like asked inappropriate questions or something it's like can you explain that to me? She says it to them and they outright just say well because you're fat now like how much weight have you gained they outright say that to her and you can see that she's struggling and she's playing like she's absolutely trying to play the game of like not making anyone mad fat phobia is a thing that big time existed in the 90s and noughties if you don't know anything about it like it was very much okay to tell people it's like oh you've gained weight that kind of destroyed 
her quite a bit. So what happened was like she was filming the Anna Nicole show. Is that theme song for you again. And after the first season of that, she kind of went into hiding for six months, right? That was when she teamed up with Trim Spa, baby. So she used these pills for the six months that she was actually gone. And you take them six times a day and they stop you from being hungry and they just like shrink your tummy. It wasn't the fact that she went back to being anorexic or anything, no unhealthy eating habits. No, there wasn't a lawsuit at all about like the misleading uh, marketing that actually involved Anna Nicole Smith as well. No, no, no. Hmm. Stop it. No, there was nothing wrong with it. So anyway, she became like the ambassador for them. And then because of all of this fat phobia, all of this shaming against her and stuff, she then came back afterwards like a beautiful butterfly and just got to show off her body yada yada again. And people were like, oh my God, you look amazing. Oh, we want to pay attention to you now because she kind of knows that the only way you can make it in Hollywood is if you have a particular body type and you're able to actually make it that way. So I don't know if she had to go for liposuction. I don't know if she went into terrible eating habits. I don't know if it was just the pills, but all of it, terrible. The worst of all was the way that people treated her. The fact that she succumbed to all of this like mental like manipulation that she was dealing with and bullying, like I'm not surprised. I more feel sorry for her that she felt like she had to do that and go to such an extreme. It was around about like 68 pounds that she lost, which is like 30 kgs. Like she lost close to 30 kgs, which is huge for six months. Like that's dangerous. So there wasn't something that was above board happening there is what I'm getting at. But you know, I guess that's internalized misogyny for you, right? Gross, 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 gross. The prescriptions. <laughs> now, in case you didn't know, Anna actually suffered from chronic pain. Like I mentioned before about her boob jobs because because she had issues with them, she had pain from them, she had to have multiple ones to get like the bigger, bigger size because she used to be a double A and went up to a double D. I can't imagine the pain that she went through. She also suffered from migraines. Now this was something that kind of like ran in the family as well. And then of course like later on due to like the press and the pressure of everything, she got so much anxiety that she couldn't sleep so she was on pills for that as well. The pills she was on for that were incredibly dangerous too. So because her bust was so large, she had like this massive back pain that she was dealing with every day and so she'd been on those drugs since like her early 20s. She's such a carefree spirit and she didn't really like have massive plans for stuff like she just sort of did things it wasn't seen as like a step-by-step -step thing so when you're giving like these very toxic medications to someone I'm saying toxic in the way that they can be easily toxic by overdosing on them which doesn't take very much in order to overdose on them she also had people around her that should have been stepping in so what she would do is like she may skip pills on some days and then just take double the dose she wouldn't be the person that would like fastidiously measure stuff should just drink straight from the bottle and so it's kind of hard to keep on top of like the 10 11 whatever medications that you're on when you're trying to like be on multiple shows and do all sorts of like charity events all of this stuff now of course as time went on the prescriptions grew and grew and when larry actually like started living with her he saw like about 10 prescriptions just on the side and he's like this is a lot like do you need some help or something? And just made like some side comments. She's like, no, but I need them for my pain and I need to be able to sleep. And it's like, this this was a lot for anyone to be taking, in particular the kind of pills that she was taking, especially in the haphazard nature that she was doing. So there's nothing wrong with having prescriptions. I don't want anyone to think that I'm judging people for like needing prescriptions or anything because I, I've definitely needed them in my lifetime too. Um, the thing is that they need to be taken properly, they need to have the instructions followed, like the thing is that, say for example you're on the pill, right? Like you know how you can't have grapefruit when you're on the pill? So you imagine that and then you also imagine taking pills from multiple different sources which all have like different ways of interacting with each other, sometimes in very negative ways because the thing is, even though she had her Dr. Kapoor who was diagnosing her with pain medication and stuff, she also had her neighbour that she was friends with who was also diagnosing her with pills, except for the fact that her neighbour was a psychiatrist who was not trained in pain medication. So Anna was taking them from both of these sources and then Howard was also getting pills for her as well. Howard? What? <laughs> now look, I'm not her doctor and all of this is speculation. I have to point that out here. Like, everything I'm saying is speculation right now. But like, the thing is that the autopsy report showed that she had been taking nine different prescription pills 
and all of which none of them were actually prescribed to her as a person they were all prescribed to different people and people were like oh but this is just what happens to stars they don't get stuff prescribed to themselves because then that will get leaked i'm like if they're already like serving a star i'm pretty sure that if they're getting flight across the bahamas they'd know who it was going to like there's literally laws in place around this stuff so yeah again in the bahamas the thing is that she was also taking human growth hormones as well as like vitamin b injections to try and stop the whole thing around aging because she was terrified of aging because all of us women sadly are those pills along with the flu along with the blood infection along with those injections like all of that combined led to her sadly passing away as well there's a separate video all about that i'm more focused on her life but i just want to point out the seriousness of the fact that these pills went unmonitored really for such a long time they kind of led to this sort of space as well as the fact that she was grieving from the loss of her son let's talk about her children now so daniel her little boy who came from her first marriage which was very abusive like it was him and her against the world effectively like they were super super close anything that she did in life it was to focus on him anytime that she'd actually be asked in like a proper interview that respected her uh, at least a dash of respect was in these interviews what's the best part about being rich to which she'd be like well I can give my son Daniel the life that I would never be able to give him otherwise. And that was like her first response to actually come out of her mouth. Everything was for her child. All of her friends knew it around her, like her partners knew it, like everything was about Daniel. Sadly, Daniel passed away literally next to her just after she'd given birth to her newborn baby, Danny Lynn, like three days afterwards. He had an overdose. I don't really want to get into it too much, but she woke up to him dead next to her and she was in such a state of delirium that she thought he was still around it was oh it was just an absolutely awful horrifying experience i cannot imagine the trauma that she like had to like endure then um and she wouldn't believe that he was dead because she'd see him on tv because of course they were casting all of this onto tv she would see it and she'd be like see look he's coming back it's absolutely fine he's coming back and yeah, sadly it looks like he actually went into her, like, drugs um, and overdosed on it. So, a very, very, very sad story. And so I can completely understand why she would have just been numbing the pain afterwards. Like, that whole month afterwards, like, her friends, when they described how she was after that, is they just said that the light just went out in Anna, which is awfully sad. Like... <sighs> I don't think that anyone would wish this on the worst enemy, like I said before, it's just terrible. And she'd also wanted a daughter for such a long time, she'd been gathering clothes for literally like, not just baby clothes, but like as she grew up. She really wanted a baby girl, so her having Danny Lynn and then not having the experience of raising her, like, it's just utterly heartbreaking. I need to talk about the biggest piece of work, Howard K. Stern and Control. Because control over women is, of course, a key component here. She had really properly cupid bow like lips, so I'm going to try. But my lip shape is not at all like hers. He went from lawyer in her court case over her deceased husband, to then live in lawyer, to then her agent, to then her lover. Okay. I'm going to try and believe that. So he was honestly by her side from the mid-90s until, like, she passed away, basically. Now, I do think that Larry was right when he says that he thinks that Howard was just with her for control, for possession. Anytime that you see photos with him in the background, because, like, he was literally by her side all the time, it's kind of like this hawk watching over its prey. It was never like the way that Larry was, which was just in a more supportive role, like, just in the background, like, chilling. It was always like... <clears throat> He was also one of the people that got her the prescription medication and he also very heavily featured in the reality TV show as well. <sighs> he also tried to say that he was the father of Anna Nicole's baby as well. Even had his name put on the birth certificate so I don't know how much manipulation had been happening because he went over to the Bahamas with her and just left Larry, like completely just left him. So it's like a lot of me really thinks that he was like a huge part to play 
and how she had like this ultimate demise. Whether it was like due to like manipulation or the fact that they had been sleeping together, I don't really care. The thing is the fact that he actually like outright went and did that and he enabled her to have like these thoughts that Larry wasn't the parent. And of course like when paternity tests came out and said that Larry was the parent, he was like, oh okay cool, this is how like you look after the baby is. So this really was a power play. That was really what it was about. But he still manages Anna Nicole Smith's estate and is still fighting that whole court case that we were talking about before. So, alright. Oh, also his talent agency name, Pop Smoochy Lips. Anna was his only client. I honestly don't really trust this man, like he's still practicing law today and I hope, same as I hope for everyone that's done bad things in their life, that he's changed as a person. Hot diggity damn, there better be enough charge in this camera to get me through this last bit of filming because this already been two hours, so. <laughs> hmm. I want to talk about how we treat women in society and how Anna Nicole Smith reflects on that and what we can learn from all of this. Now, Modern Girls actually have already done a video on this and they've touched on a bunch of points that I already had written down to talk about, but that's okay. I'll just link that video down below. And the thing is, like, there's no escape from the fact that you are bad enough of a person to enjoy sex, like Anna did. Like, Anna was actually bisexual as well, but, like, if she even, like, came out openly to say that, then that would just be sexualized even more. It wasn't seen as, like, a sexual orientation then. It was seen as fetishism. And, of course, if you're involved in sex work of any form, then you are no longer valued as a human being anymore because you're no longer human. You're now an object and that's it as an object. Well, that's been the case historically, but <laughs> baby history repeats. She just knew who she was as a person. And the thing is, this comes again into the whole cringe thing. It's like if you see someone enjoying their way of life and if it doesn't like adhere to like what society deems is okay, then you're just brandished as like cringe. And that was very much her case. It's kind of like self-confidence has already been beaten out of a child by puberty. And that's the way that it's wanted to stay. And she was confident in herself no matter what size she was at until everyone else told her that she shouldn't be. Now, look, Anna actually knew that she wasn't a smart person. But the thing to me is, right, why do we have to make people, like, tick these arbitrary boxes? Are they pretty? Are they young? Are they smart? Do they have interests that are worthy? Oh, you like makeup? Mmm... No, not good enough. I think that you should be interested in geology in order to be important. Why aren't you a paleontologist? How dare you have interests that are like anything that could be remotely feminine? It's like this whole thing around what is seen as like a worthy thing of being allowed to like and same as with people that you're allowed to deem as being worthy. It's like if you don't tick all of these boxes then you're no longer worthy. Just because she was a high school dropout doesn't mean that she's a failure. It doesn't mean that she can't be seen as being a whole human being. So much classism and elitism comes into the way that she's attacked. Same as like you see it when um, talking like AAVE. There's just so much elitism and classism and I think that we just need to shake that as a whole because it keeps so many people out of like feeling like they belong. And that's disgusting. And of course, all of this comes into the whole ageism thing as well, because like I said before, 30, oh, we just decompose. Um, we're women. <laughs> Can't cope. So it's a lot of that also comes into it as well with Anna as well. Like, you even saw this with the whole Tati thing last year. It's like, a woman of her age. And I'm like, excuse me. Sorry, as soon as you hit the age of 30, you're not allowed to have emotions and feelings. You're meant to be entirely rational and a robot <laughs> and that's just it and the thing to me is right that like, anna suffered from the most insidious parts of like the underbellies the undercurrents of like grossness of western society in my opinion like people surrounded her that enabled her and took advantage of her rather than people that were actually looking out for her best interests because in my opinion they wanted a slice of fame rather than you know actually being there for her. Except for Larry. I don't have anything against Larry. But he is raising their daughter incredibly well. I want to again come to Larry's defense. Like it seems that he is fully listening to what their daughter wants and is just fully there for her. And is like, if you don't want to do this stuff, because guests wanted her to do all these campaigns and she didn't really enjoy it when she did it. So he's like, mm, sweet, you're gonna be a kid. That's it. Like, I don't need to milk you for all your worth as like a commodity. Cause that's kind of what they were like, they keep getting phone calls about it, like still. 
I dread to think what's gonna happen to that child when she turns 16. Because the thing is, like, they don't train you, unless you're a politician and rich, how to handle all of this media stuff as well, which is part of, like, what led to her ultimate demise as well. And if you don't have people around you that are capable of, like, educating you in this stuff, supporting you properly in this stuff, and they're just kind of enabling you and waiting for you to fall, because that's kind of the way that it seems from the outside anyway, I'm like, it just feels icky. Anna Nicole Smith is one of the reasons, in my opinion, why we as a society have been working on this thing of not having to compartmentalise women into particular boxes. And I think that she's like a great case study for this, which is why I wanted to make this video about her. It's like a tragic warning of what happens when you allow this stuff to just run unleashed into the world. Because the thing is that sex work is still work, sex workers are still people. But you get vilified if you enjoy sex, you get vilified if you go down one of the oldest like forms of work in history. Like, like I said, the thing is that as women we've only been able to actually work proper jobs for a couple of hundred years and only be able to get paid equally, which is still not happening, for the past like 30 years. So when people start vilifying women for using their sexuality to their benefit, I'm like, well, you're actually mad at the system, you're not mad at her as a person, like, you need to shut the hell up. Because the thing is that we shouldn't be boxing people so tightly that they're only valued for a short shelf life, and if they only act in certain particular ways. Now, of course, it's like the situation around OnlyFans have highlighted this, and then also with Mia Khalifa, like, she's another person that has absolutely highlighted these issues as well, and I feel so sorry for her, and I really do admire her as a person as well. If you know nothing about her story, um, watch Philip DeFranco's podcast on her and watch Anthony Padilla's interview with her. I think that they've both talked to her, and honestly, it's, it's really important, like, just Go check out her work, it's really good. Like, I'm not on about the prawn that she did where she didn't really want to have to do it with the terrible contracts in place, but that's a separate issue about the sex industry that we should discuss. Like, genuinely, what's it matter? Like, a person is still a person. A person still has feelings. A person <laughs> is still vulnerable to the systems that are in play against them. And the thing is, I don't hold anything against someone that goes into sex work because I'm telling you, it's very hard to make a living, especially in this day and age. <laughs> oh, you want to buy a house and you don't have rich parents? Good heckin' luck. Oh, you want to be able to live on just one wage? <laughs> As a single person? <laughs> no, that's not allowed. Intergenerational wealth is the only way to go. Now look, again, if you haven't seen my videos on fanphobia or ageism, I highly recommend that you go check that, those out, as well as the video about why we hate each other as women. All of those three videos are very important to the topics that I'm talking about right now. Until then, if you made it all the way to the end of this video, I really, really do appreciate it. Please leave the sparkle heart emoji because I think that that is the most fitting one for Anna Nicole Smith. And um, don't forget, of course, love Liz, screw you, Rusty. I hope this has been a good part about serving a bit of justice for Anna Nicole Smith because she wasn't the villain that she was painted to be, she was actually just a sweetheart that got taken advantage of and just didn't know what she was getting herself into. Whenever I do these videos I really try and get into the mindset of the person and it's been like every time I do it it's always really really hard and harrowing and I just feel so much for her and so I'm just gonna, gonna have to watch something light and fluffy after this to bring myself back up because this has been a lot. <laughs> Editing it will be a lot, everything will be a lot, but I hope that you get something useful from these videos anyway, and I really, really do appreciate you making it all the way to the end because I know this was very, very long because I've been filming for three hours now. And anyway, I'll see you again on Tuesday. There will be a video on Sunday with a review, I guarantee it, because I've been loving some products recently and I really want to talk about them and those are way lighter. Ooh, I <laughs> just got my lipstick on this. <laughs> anyway, lovelies. Thank you and cheers. Bye. I burnt my finger so much when I was doing my hair. I did try with my hair. I followed a tutorial and everything. I really did try.